this week we are discussing protein dynamics as proved by NMR spectroscopy. So, in last lecture I mentioned why dynamics, why it is important, what, uh, what, why the dynamics is important for understanding the biological phenomena, biological function, protein, protein function and all those and what are the techniques that I summarized can be used for understanding the protein dynamics and then we uh, went ahead and looked at the how NMR can be used for understanding the protein dynamics. So, it is all about time and motion and we will continue from there. So, NMR appears to be a versatile tool for uh, the atomic structure of various time scales of transition ranging from say picosecond to second time scale motion uh, or in frequency term from terahertz to hertz right. So, there are some which which can call is internal dynamics or it is some called be uh, molecular diffusion. So, local time scale motion or a global time time scale motion and those can be probed by various NMR experiments that we mentioned. So, relaxation uh, in laboratory time frame if we do something like a T1, T2 or NOE that can prove basically the fast time scale motion ranging from picosecond to sub microsecond time scale motion. Then uh, we, we can do the relaxation in rotating frame like T1 rho, T2 rho or ROE uh, and that actually captures the microsecond to millisecond time scale motion and then even fast uh, even slower motions can be proved by exchange NMR like one of them is hydrogen deuterium exchange can be proved. So, these basically the faster time scale comes from average anisotropic interaction and this can be like a slower time scale motion can be also uh, inferred from line shape analysis. So, essentially all these utilizing some of the NMR experiment can be probed. Now, uh, for in solids since molecule tumble slowly, so in solid state you generally you have a slower time scale motion. So, what actually uh, what actually relaxation means? So, relaxation is a process by which any spins returns to their equilibrium position uh, equilibrium population. So, that means generally in a B0 magnetic field you have a spins aligned to this you create some perturbation and uh, the time that takes to come to the equilibrium position is essentially relaxation. So, it is governed by the fluctuation that happens in local field and that local field fluctuation in uh, is experienced by these nuclear spins. So, generally what is happening our spins are oriented in a stronger magnetic field and some fluctuation happening in this magnetic field and that basically causes a relaxation process. So, because of the, the fluctuation that is happening these spins will be reoriented right and that cause the variation in their interactions between two spins or their chemical shift and isotropy. So, these basically these are contributing towards the relaxation phenomena chemical shift and isotropy and dipolar coupling that uh, we are going to look little detail what these are. So, typically uh, we also looked at these heteronuclear are well suited for understanding the relaxation mechanism heteronuclear such as 13 C, 15 N. Proton has slightly complex relaxation behavior, but yes it can be used. In one case you can see you can spin dilute it change with deuterium many of the proton can be changed with deuterons and then few protons can be actually probed uh, in, in an elegant way to understand the relaxation mechanism. But typically all for all simplistic calculation in protein 13 C or N 15 or both are exploited to understand the relaxation mechanism in protein. So, relaxation mechanism actually influenced by two of the major uh, interactions one is called dipolar coupling another is called chemical shift and isotropy. There are some other which influence the uh, relaxation mechanism is called spin spin coupling or J coupling or it can be even quadrupolar coupling 
or the exchange happening between um, between the spins so major population and minor population how they are exchanging so all these essentially contributes towards the uh, relaxation mechanism dipolar coupling are between two spins chemical shift in isotropy how the spins are oriented in the magnetic field what is the anisotropic interactions in them J coupling is a scalar coupling uh, between two spins and quadrupolar like one dipole and one quadrupole interacts and chemical ex exchange as I said if it is exchanging between two states those all contributes to the relaxation mechanism. So, some basic theory of spin relaxation in protein. So, one of the major contributor is this dipolar interaction another one is chemical shift anisotropy. So, suppose in the magnetic field these are two spins spin 1 and spin 2 and they, they are separated by some distance called r r 1 2. So, this is distance and there is some angle with the main magnetic field which is theta. So, there will be dipolar interaction that depends upon this distance and also on the orientational angle and that basically contributes towards the relaxation phenomena. So, in liquid what happens this the tumbling um, most of the time averaged out this dipolar interaction. In solid that tumbling does not happen therefore, dipolar interactions are there and that is how lines in solids are broader which we are going to look at uh, in the next uh, next weeks. But to understand this is one of the cause even if averaging happen this is the one of the cause for dipolar coupling. So, if you look at if dipolar coupling is present you can see the, the there is a line splitting and that can come and line becomes broader because of this dipolar coupling. Another important phenomena that contributes to the dipolar uh, sorry relaxation phenomena is called chemical shift anisotropy. So, if spins are not tumbling and they are in the magnetic field and they so they are actually oriented in various direction right. So, each of this direction will have one resonance frequency which is shown here and if you take envelope of all these resonance frequency because of this different orientation you get a really broad line something like this and this is a essentially chemical shift anisotropy. So, because of like a the orientation depend sorry chemical shift anisotropy is essentially orientation dependence of the chemical shift. Right. So, when we start tump, like when we start tumbling of these spins, these anisotropic interactions essentially averaged out and you have a isotropic chemical shift. Generally, we see these sharp peaks in liquid state and amount spectrum. So, now in solid basically you, you spin um, very fast to make the anisotropic interaction look like a isotropic which again we are going to look at the next slides, but this anisotropy is present all over in liquid it is quite a bit averaged out because of the Brownian motion that spins can take, but this is one of the again major contributor to the relaxation phenomena. So, these two DD and CSA are dominant source of relaxation. Now, uh, yes, so this is the um, essentially spin uh, relaxation or nuclear spin relaxation depends upon two phenomena. These are the two dominant contributing phenomena the dipolar relaxation and chemical shift in isotropy. So, suppose these two spins are in the main magnetic field which is B 0 they oriented along the uh, magnetic field spin 1 and spin 2 and there is a distance between them which is R 1 2 and the angle of orientation is a theta right. So, the dipolar interaction depends upon this angle which is 3 cos square theta minus 1 and also the distance between them which is say r i s or r 1 2. So, it is a 3 to the power uh, like a uh, 1 to the power 1 divided by r to the power 3 and this gamma 1 and gamma 2 uh, are the gyromagnetic ratio of these two spins this is permittivity pi and Planck's constant. So, these are the phenomena that contributes to dipolar coupling. Now, one thing you notice this 3 cos square theta minus 1. So, typically um, these uh, this is the main contributor 
of the spin. So, if the spins are quite close that means, if this distance is short the interaction dipolar interaction is large. If it is long then dipolar interaction is weaker right. So, when we do spin dilution that means, we make spins talk to like a talk to each other in a less uh, dominant way and therefore, we reduce the spectral uh, the dipolar interaction that I was talking that proton has a complicated uh, relaxation phenomena. So, we can spin dilute it by putting deuterons a proton proton dipolar coupling can be reduced in that sense or in solid this is a trick that we are going to look at uh, in the last week of this course in solid state we always try or tends to make this term 0 by by setting or spinning the our sample at certain angle which is called magic angle. So, this 3 cos square theta minus 1 becomes 0 and that is how we try to reduce the dipolar interaction between those. The another dominant interaction that we talked is a chemical shift and isotropy this is again an orientation dependent interactions. So, in magnetic field um, spins can be oriented in various fashion and since they tumble most of the time this interactions is, is 0 uh, or it tends towards 0 because of their tumbling Brownian motion. But suppose there is some orientation uh, is remaining some orientation is still uh, there. So, they will cause uh, the chemical shift in isotropic that uh, an isotropic interaction will arise because of this will be oriented in different dimension. So, like suppose they are isotropic we see one peak and that is what we see in liquid state, but when there is a restriction in motion it is not tumbling very fast you will see some kind of an isotropic interaction emerges out and you see many uh, many uh, lines are there and if you take an envelope of all those lines you see a really broad peaks yet. So, this is chemical shift and isotropy even in solution quite a bit of those are not there averaged out, but these causes relaxation DD and CSA are major source of relaxation phenomena. Therefore, typically an isolated system is chosen uh, sorry isolated is X H spin system is chosen for relaxation rate constant where X spin like a 13 C and N 15 are chosen and the dipolar interaction between that X spin and proton is, is, is considered and also the, mag, uh, the CSA originating from X spin is contributor. So, relaxation rates that can arise because of these anisotropic interactions CSA or DD can be expressed in something called a spectral density function. So, we are going to look at what is essentially the spectral density function. So, essentially all the relaxation rate that we are talking can be expressed in, in this term spectral density function. So, I am going to explain you soon what is relaxation uh, spectral density function, but before I go to a spectral density function let me define something one is called correlation function right. So, correlation functions uh, and then we will come to a spectral density functions. So, correlation function in, in any case so, uh, the correlation function can be given g of t with time 1 by 5 exponential t by tau c. Now, this tau c essentially is the correlation time. So, correlation function for an isotropic diffusion of a rigid rotor we call le, let us explain this spin as a rigid rotor can be given in this term g of t 1 by 5 exponential t by tau c. Now, this correlation time which is tau c is a time constant right for an exponential decay of the function tau c is approximate amount that molecule take to make rotation by 1 radian. So, how much time it takes to make rotation by 1 radian that is a tau c correlation time ok. So, short correlation time essentially short correlation time causes the correlation functions to decay rapidly whereas a long correlation time long correlation time makes function to decay slowly and these correlation time essentially depends upon the molecular weight of a molecule and what is the shape 
what is the solvent viscosity, what is the temperature. So, let me simplify this. If a molecule is bigger, right? Molecule is bigger, that means in solution it will tumble slowly. If the molecule is smaller, in solution it will tumble fast. If the solvent is viscous, that means the molecular tumbling will be also slow. If you rise the temperature, the same molecule can now uh, like uh, can make a rotation fast. So, it depends upon various the shape and size of a molecule, molecular weight of a molecule, the solvent viscosity whether it is more viscous or, or less viscous solvent and what is the temperature. So, correlation like a correlation function with the time can be expressed like this. So, suppose a molecule has the correlation time of 50 nanosecond, it is a correlation function will decay slowly and if it has a correlation time of 1 nanosecond, you can say it decays very fast, right. So, very fast. So, that is what here we will saying, it is time exponential decay of a function, it is approximately the amount of time molecule uh, takes to make one radian and if the correlation function is decaying rapidly here, it takes a long time to cause a function to decay like a, if it is um, decaying rapidly, it takes long time. Okay. So, short correlation time like this function decay rapidly, long correlation time function decay slowly. So, that is a correlation time. The another one we are talking the spectral density function. So, it is essentially the power, right. So, power it is connected with the correlation time. So, suppose here the correlation time is 100 nanosecond, that means the molecule is 100 nanosecond molecule is solely uh, tumbling. So, you can see the spectral density function which is j omega, right. So, omega is a frequency, j is a spectral density function with the frequency it dies or dies very rap rapidly. If the correlation time is shorter like 1 nanosecond, this is very very slowly decaying. So, a spectral density function decays very slowly. So, j omega, uh, j of omega is given by this function where tau c is the correlation time, 1 omega is the frequency and again tau c. So, it is store the power of, of, a, of a molecule how rapidly or how how uh, uh, quickly or how, how slowly it decays, how the power it dissipates that is what the spectral density function is saying. So, for a longer correlation time it can dissipate power very fast, if a shorter correlation time it dissipates power very slowly with the frequency that is the spectral density function tells about. And we said that we can express our relaxation parameters in terms of a spectral density function. So, a spectral density function j omega is a Fourier transform of correlation function just as rapidly relaxing domain signal give rise to a broader line. If something is rapidly decaying, it gives the broader line. If something is slowly decaying, it gives the sharper line, right. So, give rise to broader line, short correlation time um, like uh, have a broader spectral density function. So, this makes molecule sense that molecule tumbles very rapidly can, can sample a wide range of frequency and molecule that tumbles slowly have a very long correlation time and only samples fewer frequency. So, let me explain again. So, a small molecule, a small protein, a small bio, uh, a small peptide and all those tumbles very fast. A bigger molecule tumble, tumbles slowly. So, if the molecule is, 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 is tumbling rapidly, that means it can sample a wide range of frequency. That it can essentially wide range of frequency say here in this correlation function the molecule which is which is a shorter correlation time can essentially samples the all frequency right. So, a smaller molecule can basically samples the wide range of frequency or a bigger molecule a protein of 2 kd can sample many frequency a molecule of 100 kd which correlation time is about 100 nanosecond samples only few frequency. 
right so that's that's the molecule tumbles very rapidly can sample a wide range of frequency and molecule that tumbles slowly like a bigger protein have a very long correlation time and only can sample few frequency that's essentially a spectral density function tells about it's a fourier transform of a correlation function right so so now if we know this what is correlation function now we can express our relaxation parameters in terms of this spectral density function so r1 which is longitudinal relaxation rate can can uh, come from the r1 because of d dipolar coupling r1 because of csa and you can explain this r1 in terms of this formula uh, where the spectral density function of the h spin and x spin is given. So, d square divided by 4 6 j omega h plus omega x. Uh, so, this is the joint frequency that h and x are evolving that is a, a spectral density function for proton and carbon 13. This is the difference in the spectral density function or and then individual uh, spectral density function of x as well as h spin. So, that all contributes towards the relax, uh, relaxation of, of these spins in R1 longitudinal relaxation rate. Similarly, R2 can be given by these formula R2 of dipolar coupling uh, uh, and R2 due to CSA and it again depends upon the spectral density function of proton and carbon given by these formula uh, omega h plus omega h x here individual spectral density the difference of spectral density and the spectral density at a zero frequency okay so <coughs> that's what r2 and then this is uh, cross relaxation so these are individual relaxation and this is cross relaxation this again will be given by the sum of these two frequency and difference of the of these two frequency so r1 r2 and sigma xh are the rate constant for spin lattice relaxation as well as spin re, spin relaxation and this one is cross relaxation right how the h and x spin cross relaxing with each other that is given by sigma xh so these now we can see that these simple relaxation parameter the individual r1 and r2 uh, spin spin and spin lattice relaxation can be given by the spectral density function of the individual spins x and h their joint frequency, their difference frequency and the zero frequency. So, in terms of these spectral density function, we can explain our R1 and R2. So, dependent of a spectral density function can be evaluated on these 5 frequency. What are those 5 frequency? The joint frequency omega h and omega x. So, omega h plus omega x, omega h, omega h minus omega x, omega x and 0. So, these are 5 different frequency which which uh, which can contribute towards this spectral density function right. The sum of the parameters that I had uh, given in the previous slides like a d is essentially these parameter which also depends upon the distance between the x and h and rest are the gyromagnetic ratio or Planck constant and permeativity of the vacuum the the uh, x h is essentially the bond length and omega x omega h are gyromagnetic ratio and c is a constant right so so now uh, delta delta is the csa of the x spin right so uh, and you consider that the chemical shift tensor is axially symmetric now uh, you can tell it csa for different nuclei which are typically given for n15 uh, this chemical shift and isotropy is about 170 ppm uh, references from here and for carbonyl about delta delta is about 35 ppm for for c alpha it is about 30 ppm so these are various constant that were plucked in uh, can be plucked in here to find it out uh, their contribution coming from different different relaxation rate Okay. So, now the R1 and R2 rate constant are determined uh, experimentally 
we are going to look at how we can determine on proteins and the cross relaxation rate uh, whereas uh, sigma x h is determined from the, the steady state you know that also we are going to look at how we can determine from the how we can design an experiment to do this heteronuclear NOE. So, as we mentioned this cross relaxation rate depends upon d and the value of d is given here. The spectral density function can be coming from NOE minus 1. So, R1 uh, R1 multiplied NOE minus 1 and NOE can be given as 1 plus the sigma xh by R1 you can just uh, rejig and do little bit of algebraic con conclusion. So, you can find it out the NOE that we calculate experimentally uh, can basically come from these numbers spectral density function. So, NOE is this cross correlation rate. So, if we do the ex three basic experiment R1, R2 and heteronuclear NOE, we can essentially determine the all spectral density function and tau C and that is what typically is done in the protein NMR. So, spectral density function at the 5 frequency cannot be determined from 3 exponentially determined relaxation rate constant by just measuring T1, T2 and NOE. So, assumption must be made so that only 3 unknown need to be determined from this 3 value right. So, we are want to determine the 5 frequency omega at omega h, omega x, omega h plus omega x, omega h minus omega h and 0. So, those are 5 frequency we wanted to determine just from 3 rates which is not possible. So, we need to make some assumptions. So, that 3 equation and 3 unknowns are there. So, there are various mathematical models that maps the spectral density function and one of them is model free analysis widely known as Lipari's Zabo model free analysis and that basically gives this site specific internal motion of protein will be towards the end of this uh, week we are going to briefly touch upon what is the modal free analysis, but essentially it can be determined from this relaxation rate by making some assumptions and we will be looking at that. So, today I am going to uh, give you a glimpse and we can continue over it what experiments are done for measurement of relaxation parameter. So, typically what we, whatever we have learned right HSQC or HMQC based experiment can be utilized for understanding the relaxation rate like a T1 and T2 or even NOE. So, concept is that we plugged in these parameters where we can uh, we can determine the T1 or T2 or NOE from these HSQC or HMQC based experiment doing a heteronuclear relaxation uh, who are doing the heteronuclear correlation experiment for determining the heteronuclear relaxation. So, essentially we start with a preparation of desired coherence and then we invoke this T, uh, T1 delay uh, for the like autocorrelation or cross correlation and then we encode the frequency. So, here T1 period we encoding the frequency and then we transfer the magnetization. Uh, to proton nuclei and then you acquire on proton and then we give some delay like a D1 delay between the scans. So, typically this is the pulse sequence design we are going to start with a preparation phase invoking the delay so that we can encode the T1 or T1 relaxation time or T2 relaxation time. Then we encode the frequency in indirect dimension then we transfer back magnetization to proton acquire proton and encode the T2 frequency uh, so that we can do a, a, a like a this delay time dependent HSQC and finally, towards end of pulse sequence we give the relaxation delay so that magnetization returns to the equilibrium states. So, these are typical design of an HSQC, HMQC based T1 and T2 relaxation. Next class I am going to discuss how we can basically design a pulse sequence to measure the T1 and T2 and what data, how data comes and how we can interpret this data for understanding the relaxation mechanism in protein. So, with this I let me close it today and looking forward to have you in the next class. Thank you very much.